Okay, so welcome to MKTG 617, Internet Business and Electronic Marketing. Today, it's our third lecture. And in today's lecture, we will be looking at theories and conceptual approaches in e-marketing research. Now, the main reason why I decide to do this as part of every course I teach is because we as researchers, right, let's put the marketing aside, at the base of it have the dexterity of applying multiple theories, regardless of your area of specialization to your research work. So if you are doing research in marketing, nothing stops you from picking a theory from psychology or a theory from MIS or a theory from HR to be able to explain portions of the marketing phenomenon that you're trying to study. So for me, as part of every course that I teach, I make it a must to expose my students to the application of theory in that particular concept or course that I'm teaching. Because there are theories that are applicable in the various courses that we will observe in literature have been applied. So by introducing you to theory in each course that I teach, assuming I teach you about three or four times, by the time you finish, passing through all the courses I've taught you, you would have at least learned about four theories, one for each course that I have taught you, right? And with that, you will have enough theories in your arsenal that you can fall on in case you find yourself doing some research and you need a theory to explain a concept or a phenomenon. Now, one major problem I know students have is with their ability to understand what a theory even is and to appreciate it and how it can fit into their research work. So the aim of this course is to help us to be able to understand the foundations of theory. What is theory? What does it entail? Okay, so Leila, too, if you were here on day one, I issued a caveat, right? And it's in the course outline under the course policies that I reserve the right to modify the course outline at any time. Who remembers I said that? Good. So please go to the Sakai platform and download the most updated version of the course outline and you will see what I'm talking about. So based on the most updated version of the, of the course outline, today we are treating theories and conceptual approaches in e-marketing research. Okay, so I'm going to expose you to theories, their foundations, what they are how we can interpret them in terms of application to our research work, right? And we will also try our hands in real time at coming up with concepts and how to use theory to explain these concepts. So by the end of this session, there are three main learning outcomes we hope to achieve. The first one being to be able to appreciate the nature, building blocks and benefits of theory in social science research, right? Because we are social scientists. And then we will also be able to explain the building blocks of the media richness theory, which is an example of a theory that can be applied to e-marketing or digital marketing. And we will see how it has been applied in an article, right? And then we will also be able to explain the application of the media richness theory in an e-marketing study. Now, by the end of the session, once we go through all these learning outcomes, and you have been able to appreciate them, you'll be able to now pick on any theory and be able to dissect it and break it down into its building blocks and apply it to a given research. Please, does it make sense? Yes. Yes. Hello. Please, there are not only two people in this class. I expect to hear from everyone else in the class. So if you okay. do not want to speak or your microphone is not working, you can use the reactions as well, but I need to be able to know that everybody is here and present. Otherwise, I'll assume you are ghosting. And that means you are not in class at all. Please, I hope that is understood. Yes, Doc. So if yes, Pia yes, and Clancy yes, are not the yes, only two people in this class, there are others, about 25 others, or 20, 24 others. Okay. So let's get into it. So the first question we would want to answer in this session is, what is a theory? So a theory is used to denote a model or a set of concepts and propositions that pertains to some actual phenomena. So if there's a phenomenon that you are trying to study 
And there's a theory that has been developed to explain that phenomenon. The theory will essentially come in the form of a model, right? Sometimes it comes in the form of a, a graphical model or in the form of a statement presenting a set of concepts and certain propositions about how these concepts relate to each other. So with the help of a theory, you can gain an understanding of whatever phenomena it is you are studying or the form or to be able to form the basis for action with respect to these phenomena. Because different phenomena that we study, be it customer loyalty, customer satisfaction, all have processes and concepts that help them to come about. So you can't study them in isolation without looking at the underpinning concepts and the propositions that explain how these concepts come together to give us whatever phenomena we are experiencing, be it customer loyalty or customer satisfaction or attrition or whichever phenomenon it is that you want to look into as a researcher. So basically theory describes, predicts and explains why things happen. So like I said, if you have a, a concept like customer satisfaction, the theory relating to customer satisfaction will tell us how and why customer satisfaction takes place. By explaining the concepts involved in customer satisfaction and the propositions that link these concepts together. Please, does it make sense? Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes. So on the basis of that, I'm putting this question to the class. Does anyone know the theory that underpins customer satisfaction? There's an ancient theory in marketing that underpins customer satisfaction. It dates back to the 90s. Does anyone know that theory? I'm waiting. Because apart from Isaac, I know almost everyone in this class has a marketing background. So you should have come across that theory, either in consumer behavior, or in principles of marketing. Bafo Apia. Bafo Apia. Hello, hello, Doc. Uh -huh. Have you heard of that theory? I haven't, Doc. You haven't? Okay, do you want to take a lawyer? Hey, who is me? Um, I give you the, yes, the power doc. to nominate anyone. Yes, mention any name and pass it on. Yes, Doc. Doc Nuruddin. Nuruddin, save your brother. Nuruddin, we are waiting on you to save your brother. Um. <laughs> Let me give you a clue. It is by a researcher who goes by the name of Oliver. Oliver. Uh, yes. It was no, I think I, I, I need some, some small time. Really? So, <laughs> so are you also going to get a lawyer? Take um, a lawyer. And I will propose a cure. Why a queer? A queer has been saving you people since we started the class. So pick someone else. Man, a queer and Clancy man, are off clancy. limits. Pick someone. That would be Clancy. That would be, be Clancy. No, Clancy has also been helping a queer save you people. They've been responding to everything since the class started. So give them a break. Someone okay. else. Okay. Uh, name someone Isaac. else. Isaac Olsen. Isaac Olsen. <laughs> Very ironic, eh? He was he was busy nominating somebody. Isaac, the ball is in your court. Okay. Um. So, uh, I, I honestly, I just read it from Google. Okay. Tell me. Uh, yes, With my clues that the theory, I gave you. Yes, please. The theory okay. presumes that customers make purchases based on their expectations, attitudes, and intentions. So, what is the name of the theory? I I just want the name. Oh, okay. I just want the name. Customer satisfaction theory. That's another name for it. That's like the, the pseudo name, the AKA. But it has an actual name. Okay. I think I recall. But it's, it, yes, it's also called the customer it, satisfaction it, theory. But it has a, it a generic quality. name. No, it's not a service quality theory. Service quality. Uh, 
It's not service quality theory, Isaac. Deborah has put it in the comments. But Deborah has, has made a small mistake. Oh, okay. It's a theory. Deborah, come again. No, I want to hear it from Deborah. Okay. I want to hear it from Deborah. Ex uh, expectancy disconfirmation theory. Okay, so that's another mistake that a lot of articles have been making. It's actually not expectancy disconfirmation. It's expectation disconfirmation. Oh, okay. Right? So please, do we all now know the actual name of it? Okay. Yes, Thank so you. what is it called? Expectation confirmation theory. theory. And please, the one who Google, yeah. what is the what is the full name of the researcher? Richard Oliver. Richard Oliver, good, right? What year was the article that he propounded it in published? Nineteen eighty. Nineteen eighty. Okay, but there was an updated version somewhere in the nineties, right? So, good. So, in the event that you decide to use this theory, you need to be abreast of all the updates that have been made to it. Please, does it make sense? Yes, please. Thank yes, you. So the, yes, so for the yes. students, you see what we just did right now and the way I did it nicely. <laughs> this is what you will be yes. getting in your seminar, only you will not be getting it this nice. Hey. It will be very hot and very fast. <laughs> Epia Jan knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> We'll be ready. Because you're expected to know the literature of head, especially the literature that relates to your area of research. You see? So, so now we've learned one theory, right? Now we know expectation disconfirmation yes. theory by Richard Oliver, right? In 1980, In 1980, it was 1980, please. 1980, good. So Oliver, 1980, expectation disconfirmation theory is the theory that backs what, what phenomenon? Customer satisfaction. Awesome. We've already learned one. Let's go on. Okay. So still on the issue of theories, right? When it comes to the distinction between mm -hmm. quantitative and qualitative research, they both apply theory differently, right? So a qualitative researcher will take the same theory, but how he will go about proving or disproving the theory or using it to explain a phenomenon is slightly different from the way someone who is using it in a quantitative study would use it. So the qualitative person will basically be focusing on the propositions that exist between the concepts and try and see how those propositions play out in real life. Whereas a quantitative person will pick the concepts, turn them into variables, and then turn the propositions into hypotheses, and then test them to see if they are significant or insignificant. Please, do we understand? Yes, Doc. Okay. Yes, doc. So qualitative yes, researchers doc. have generally accepted the view that all observation is theory laden, right? And that there's no possibility of purely objective or theory neutral descriptions independent of some particular perspective. Meaning that if you actually want to do proper yes, research, be it quantitative or qualitative, it should be based or founded in theory. Please, do we all understand that? Yes, Doc. Good. So if you are doing your research work, be it your MBA long essay or your MPhil thesis, the concepts that you are studying, we expect that naturally you would find some theory that will help us to explain and understand the relationship between the concepts that you are studying. So theory, therefore, is an inescapable component of all research, full stop. Whether or not you explicitly acknowledge it or you don't, there's always some element of theory involved in the research that you do. And that Doc. is why, yes, Bafo. Uh, please, so that means that 
there's no long essay. You cannot write a long essay without any theory. There must always be a theory. Yes. Even the theories that you, even the concepts that you put together, why do you put them together into a framework? Mm. You put them together into a framework because you are theorizing that there's some kind of relationship between them, true or false? Bafo? Bafo, are you there? True, true, Doc. True. So if there is no theory backing what you are doing, then why are you putting the variables together? That is why we talk about the fact that it can be either explicitly stated, right? Or inexplicitly yeah. stated. But either way, there's always some theory either silently operating there or overtly op operating. It's up to you to decide okay. to make it pronounced or not. So I can do a study on customer satisfaction and say um, perceived quality and um, lead time and um, delivery condition or influence customer satisfaction and then leave it at that without explicitly stating that I'm using expectation disconfirmation theory to, to explain the phenomenon that is occurring. But technically, that is what I'm using because how will perceived quality influence customer satisfaction? It will only influence customer satisfaction in the sense that the customer is expecting to receive some level of quality. Therefore, if the quality that they receive is not what they expected, you can say that they are dissatisfied. But if it is what is expected, we can say that they are satisfied. And that, in essence, is expectation disconfirmation. Do you understand me? Yes, Doc. Yes, so theory is inescapable. You can't escape it. So with that being said, what is a theory not? So right now we know what a theory is. So now let's look at what a theory is not. First of all, a theory is not data. It is not a collection of facts. It is not typologies or taxonomies or empirical findings, right? Again, if you put together a collection of constructs, you cannot call it a theory. Because theories must go beyond just the constructs as they have been presented to include the propositions of how the constructs relate to each other and explanations about how the constructs relate to each other, giving a set of boundary conditions. Because you know, most of the time when you see a theory, it gives you the conditions under which the constructs in the, in the theory will affect each other. Not every theory does that, but there are theories that do that. Right? So to be able to spot what a theory is, you need to be able to see constructs and see propositions that tell us how these constructs relate to each other, as well as explanations relating to the assumptions or the boundary conditions within which these theories would actually explain the phenomenon that we are trying to study. So we can say that data, facts, and findings operate at the empirical or observational level while theories operate at a what? Conceptual level and are based on logic rather than operation, uh, observation, sorry. So in the event that you are deciding your research topic, you are operating at a conceptual level and at that level, you are expected to apply theory. That is why when I ask students why you chose your research topic and they tell me that, okay, I observe that entrepreneurs these days are struggling to find sources of funding or are struggling to market their products. So I decided to study how entrepreneurs can effectively market their products. At that point, you are not thinking logically or theoretically. You are thinking in terms of what? What are you thinking in terms of? Based on what I just said. Observation. Observation. And in research, we don't care much about observation especially at the graduate level. At the graduate level, we are thinking about theory and at a conceptual level. What is theory saying that we need to know about this phenomenon that we do not know yet? And once you can establish what the theory is saying we need to know that we do not know, you will know which direction to take your research in to help answer that question of what we do not know. Please, am I making sense? 
Yes, please. Yes. I know that yes, material God. is heavy, right? But you need to hear this. Because I presume that a number of you have already started your long essay. MBA year two. Ron, what are you writing on? Ron, at two mail. Yeah, yes, Doc. What is your um, long essay on? Um, I'm, I'm looking at the retail industry. Okay, what about the retail industry? Um, so I'm looking at how um, the brand resilience model relates to the retail industry, how it can be effectively used. Okay, so what's the theory backing your, your long essay? Um, so, yeah, so I'm going to use the... Um, uh, I, I, I need to do a little recap. You don't need to do uh, a little uh, recap. <laughs> you just said that you are looking at how the brand resonance model applies to the retail industry. True or false? Yes. And what is brand resonance? And what is the brand resonance model? So it's under it's under um, a, a whole category. And that's what I'm looking at. But mm -hmm. So that, brand uh, resonance is an early, Okay, so hold on. I teach brand management. So let's break this down. Brand resonance is is what is that is the apex of the customer based brand equity pyramid true or false yeah true true okay so the customer based brand equity model is essentially a theory yes so why did is. you decide to separate one construct out of the theory and, and focus on, on that construct um, um there has been extensive research on the other elements mm -hmm. Of, of, of that model. So that's why I chose the um, brand resonance model. Good. So do you see how we have just broken down the whole theory behind what you're doing? Yes. Good. So we have right now established that the CBBE model is the theory you are looking at. And other dimensions of the theory or other constructs within the theory, right? From the base of the pyramid all the way up have been studied. But one particular construct in the theory, which is brand resonance, has received limited attention. So your research is focusing on that. And that's what you want to study for your long essay. Does that not sum up all that I just said? Yes, Doc, it Good. does. So please, do we understand now what I'm driving at? Yes, yes Doc. Doc. Yes, Good. Doc. Yes, Doc. Good. So let's talk about the characteristics of a theory. So first of all, we can talk about the fact that theory is abstract and refers at least in part to entities or ideas that are hypothesized, abstracted, or inferred rather than directly observable. So in Ron's case, we can't directly observe brand resonance, right? It's more of an abstract concept that we infer based on a number of, of factors, right? We can also talk about the fact that theory is general. It refers not only to a single instance or case, but to all instances or cases of a particular type. So brand resonance is a general concept that can be applied in different sectors to be able to test the level at which a brand resonates with a particular segment of customers, right? We can also talk about the fact that theory is typically explanatory. It tells us why things happen rather than simply describing what happened. So Ron, based on what you know about brand resonance, if you are explaining from the perspective of the customer based brand equity model, which I think you should be familiar with, you should be able to tell us how brand resonance happens. True or false? Uh, true, Doc. Good. Right? Because it's in a pyramid for meaning that to, for brand resonance to happen, the brand has to do what? Ron, for brand resonance to happen, what does the brand have to do? Um. Uh, uh, Doc, there are, lit <laughs> there are bits, uh, there are a lot of steps involved in this. So there are not that many. Uh, if I can remember all of them, and I'm not doing my long essay on it, why can't you who, who are doing your long essay on it, Ron? Yeah, yes, uh, Doc, it has been, the levels? I believe uh, there are about five of them. Uh, Ron. Um, 
Look, let me, let me, I'll, 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 I'll come back on that. Oh, no, 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 we are waiting on you. You have to be able to tell us. <laughs> you are doing the long essay like now, 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 now. Okay, okay, let me, let me quickly open my. Uh -huh. So you are going to search, okay. So resonance uh, is the uh, tippy top, the apex, right? And it starts from the bottom, beginning right. with brand identity. Did you know that? Uh, yes, yes, doc. Followed by brand meaning, which involves performance and imagery. Then to brand response, which involves judgments and feelings, which ultimately leads, ultimately leads up to resonance. So in your long Let's essay, go. if you are looking at the application of brand resonance to the retail sector, you can't look at it without looking at the steps that lead up to resonance. Are you with me? Yes, no. I, because according to yes, theory, no. I, I, they go I, I, together. Yes, Doc. So I'll talk about the whole equity model. Then it's not, it's I'll, not called I'll then the break equity it model. Uh -uh. It's not called the equity model. Please, another thing. I am I am not happy about the way students massacre the names of models and researchers and theories. They are giving names for a reason. <laughs> so please don't massacre them. So Ron, it's not the equity model. We, right now, we've learned how to, to, to properly say the expect expectation disconfirmation theory, not expectancy disconfirmation, it's expectation disconfirmation. So please say the proper name of the model you are using because it's the basis of your long essay, Ron. So what is the actual name of the model? Yeah. So um, consumer brand equity model. Mm -mm. Come again, we just mentioned it right now. I've mentioned it like twice. What is the name of the model actually? Ron. Well, I'm picking on you because you are the class rep. Uh, it's like, yes, um, you are the one that people yes. have to call for advice. You are the Zen zone. <laughs> so if the Zen zone is what, like, where will people go? <laughs> okay. Uh, uh -huh. So co co customer-based brand equity model. Good. Or for short, the CBBE model. Yes, Doc. Okay. Yeah. Well established. Ladies and gentlemen, please do not be perturbed or be afraid. I'm just prepping you for what is to come. Right? I'm just prepping you for what is to come. And, oh, and, and it's once, scary. Yes. It's not scary at all. In fact, once you have been able to go through this, you will be you will be somewhat prepared when you start. It will make sense to you once you get into it. You see, Ron is able to banter with me right now because he's going through it. Are you with me? Yes, please. Good. Yes, so he please. gets it. So what we discussed right now, when Ron goes back, I kid you not, it will reflect in his work. Ron, true or false? <laughs> true, dog. Yeah, because it helps you to refine your thoughts when you start thinking in the line of theory. And it makes your work better in terms of contributing to existing knowledge. Because you don't want to do research that does not contribute to existing knowledge. And most of the contribution we make is in the area of theory. Please, do you understand me? Yes, doc. So don't be scared. Just embrace, <laughs> embrace it, right? Just embrace it. So basically, we have seen the characteristics of a theory. Now let's go into the benefits of applying theory in research, right? The first one we can talk about is the fact that considering theory in your research enhances the robustness and rigor, as well as the relevance and impact of the findings that you come up with. Because like I said, no one wants research that does not contribute to anything. No one wants research that is not relevant to anything. You want the findings of your research to be relevant so that it will contribute to existing knowledge. And for those of you who want to study further and do PhDs, when you finish your MPhil or your MBA, you hope to get a publication or two out of your long essay. If your long essay or your thesis does not have a strong theoretical backing, it is difficult for you to be able to get good publications out of it. So the theory backing your work has to be strong so that it will be relevant and have an impact such that if you finish your work and you extract a publication out of it and you send it out for independent peer review, they will find it to have some relevance and impact enough to accept it for publication in their journal. Please, do you understand me? Yes, 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 yes,
another benefit of the applying theory in research is the fact that theories can connect pieces of research data to generate finding. So for instance, in research based on experience, you will find out that sometimes you do a study, you collect some data, you analyze, and you have some findings that you can't really understand. And then all of a sudden you come across this theory that in a nutshell explains plainly what is happening in terms of the findings that you have obtained and connects all the pieces between the various concepts that have emerged as significant and the impacts that they are having on each other. So theories in that way are connecting the pieces of your research data to help you to generate meaningful findings, which would fit into the larger framework of other studies. Because like I mentioned, if the work you are doing in terms of research is not contributing to the knowledge that is already there and other studies that have been done, then you are not necessarily doing what you think you're doing as a researcher. At the same time, so we can talk about the fact that, like I mentioned earlier, theories can be applied at many stages of quantitative and qualitative research processes, depending on the kind of theory that you are using, the propositions that it gives, and the kind of phenomenon that you are studying. So this, in a nutshell, again, emphasizes the importance of having theory as part of our research. But theories, regardless of how relevant they are, also have their limitations, right? The first one we can talk about is the fact that as simplified explanations of reality, theories may not always provide adequate explanations of the phenomenon that we are studying, right? It may only be able to explain perhaps a limited set of the constructs in your framework. So for instance, in my PhD, I had an extensive framework that had three levels. Now the theory I began with in the beginning was a theory we refer to as the commitment trust theory by Morgan and Hans, 1994. And this theory basically talks about the fact that commitment and trust are the mediating variables in any relationship between a seller and a buyer or between a brand and their customer. However, in my model, I was looking at e-marketing and how e-marketing tools can be used to create certain situations or events that influence the commitment and trust of customers, which ultimately influences their loyalty. So in this case, the Morgan and Hunt commitment trust theory was only explaining what was happening in the middle of my framework and not explaining the technological events, right? Being engagement and interactivity and personalization and collaboration and advocacy, which were influencing these two mediating variables that the commitment trust theory had explained. So in that case, we are witnessing the first limitation of theory. One theory may be able to explain part of your framework, but not the whole. So I went in for another theory, this time from information systems, which is referred to as the signaling theory. And it talks about the fact that you can use technology to create events and situations to signal certain behaviors or to signal consumers to engage or exhibit certain reactions. So I combined the signaling theory with the commitment trust theory to explain what was happening in my framework from beginning to end. And that helped me to be able to address the first limitation of theory, being that one theory will not be enough to explain all the, the constructs that are in your framework that capture the phenomenon that you're trying to study. Please, I hope that makes sense. Yes, Doc. Yes, Doc. Okay. Yes, doc. So, Isaac, so you said in the case where the theory that would explain findings is it yet to be propounded, what happens, please? Yeah. In that case, you do not use an explicit theory. Your theory will be implicit. Because like I said, even the constructs that you put together from the literature have some element of theory. Because theory basically talks about how concepts or constructs relate to each other and provide propositions about how they relate to each other. So in that case, if an, a theory does not exist that has been propounded to adequately explain the phenomenon you are trying to study, then you will implicitly imply theory by using the concepts or the constructs that you have identified in literature. And the literature that are saying that these constructs or variables can be put together in this form to have an effect on this other variable is also a form of theory. So when we say theory, it is not just the well-established theories that we see that have names that have been propounded and tested severally over the years, right? Theory also comes from the conceptual approaches that we have observed in empirical literature that we apply to our research on a daily basis. 
That's why we are looking at both theoretical and conceptual approaches. Yes, you can use a theory to support your research method. In fact, there's a whole research method in qualitative that is based on one theory. Who knows about that, that theory? In qualitative research, there's a research method in qualitative research that is a whole theory on its own. Who knows it? Who knows it? You should know this because I'm sure you've all done research methods before. Should I name names? Esaba Asan. I think I got it right. Esaba, are you there or you're ghosting? No, please, I'm not ghosting, but please, I'm not sure what's the. You are not sure. Do you have an idea? No, or you also don't no, have an idea? No, please, I don't. Who is saying Sondes et al? Sondes et al is a research methods book. <laughs> Lauren, Sondes et al is a book. Come on. I'm talking about a theory that doubles as a research method in qualitative research. Has anyone heard of grounded theory before? Has anyone heard of grounded theory? No, I haven't. You haven't heard of grounded no, no. theory? No, I haven't. Okay, so I'm, I'm introducing to you grounded theory. It's a theory and at the same time, it's a, it's a research method in qualitative research. So you can read more about it in your leisure time. So Manap, I hope that answers your question. Yes, you can use a theory to support your research method and grounded theory is a typical example. Yes, okay. Madam. Good. All right. And then the third limitation we can talk about is that theories may impose blinders or limit researchers range of vision causing them to miss out on important concepts that are not defined by the theory, right? So this is a direct response to Isaac's question of what if the theory has not been propounded yet. The fact that an explicit theory has not been propounded to explain the relationship between the concepts in the phenomenon you are trying to study does not mean that you should not study it. Because conceptually, empirical research has been able to prove that those variables have some kind of link or relationship. So not have finding a theory to explicitly explain what you are doing does not mean that it is not right. Because conceptually, empirical research has proven that there's, there's something there that needs to be explored further. Please, I hope it makes sense. Yes, Doug. Yes, Doug. Okay. So now, let's, so now let's look at the building blocks of a theory, right? A theory has four main building blocks. We can first talk about the construct. And here the constructs capture the what of theories. That is what concepts are important to explaining a phenomenon, right? So let's look at a typical example of the expectation disconfirmation theory. Looking at that theory, what constructs do you think are important in explaining the phenomenon of customer satisfaction? Just base it off the name of the theory, expectation disconfirmation. What do you think the constructs are? Hello. I need you to put on your philosophy cap. Start thinking as researchers. Because you're all research students, whether you like it or not. So from the, the name of the theory, expectation, disconfirmation, what are the concepts that are important to explaining customer satisfaction? Given that the expectation disconfirmation theory tells us how customer satisfaction comes about. Hello. Um, Mida. Well, can I try? Okay, Isaac, you can go ahead. Okay, I'm just trying. So, yes. um, ex customer expectation would be one. Good. Uh, service delivery could be another. Delivery. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Limit yourself to the name of the theory. Okay. So you're giving me one, which is customer expectation. Okay. So based on the name of the theory, give me another concept. Isaac, come on. 
It's right Sorry, there. disconfirmation. Disconfirmation. Yes. Right? So the two constructs we need, which are important to explaining the phenomenon of customer satisfaction. So Deborah, satisfaction here is the phenomenon. And we are looking for the constructs that explain it. So here, good job, Isaac. We have been able to establish that the constructs are expectation and disconfirmation, right? So that brings us to the next building block, which is proposition. How are these concepts related to each other? So here we are asking, how is expectation related to this confirmation? Are you with me? Yes, please. Good. Yes, so please. based on the theory, the how or the proposition of how expectation relates to this confirmation is that expectations refer to the expectations that the customers bring to the consumption mm. experience, right? And the disconfirmation here can either be positive disconfirmation or negative disconfirmation. So if the expectations that they bring are positively disconfirmed, it leads to some aspect of satisfaction. And if the expectations that they bring are negatively disconfirmed, it also leads to another aspect of satisfaction. Please, does it make sense? Yes, please. Yes, Doc. So I just told you how expectations and the disconfirmation relate to each other. True or false? Sure. Yes. Good. So now we know the constructs, right? Yes, please. Yes. And we know the propositions, which tell us the how of how the concepts relate to each other. Yeah. Now let's go to the next building block, which is logic. The why. Why are these concepts related? Why are expectations related to this confirmation? Expectations are related to this confirmation because marketers are in the business of satisfying customer needs. True or false? True. And based yeah, on the true. customer's need, good. And based on the customer's need, they come to every purchase experience with some level of expectations. Because they are yes. expecting that whatever they are about to purchase will satisfy yes. that need that they have. True or false? True. True. Good. True. Good. So they are looking forward to receiving what they are expecting. And if they do not receive what they are expecting, we refer to it as a negative disconfirmation. Okay. And if they receive what they are expecting, we refer to it as a what? A positive disconfirmation. Positive disconfirmation. So now do we see the logic behind it? Yes. 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 So now we know the constructs, we know the propositions, and we know the logic. The next thing we can talk about is the assumptions. And these examine the who, when, and where. Under what circumstances will these concepts and relationships work? I take your hand is up. Yes, please. So um, regarding the third point on logic, yes. is it possible to represent um, the relationship mathematically? Yes, it is. Okay. That is why in quantitative research, we can represent the relationship between concepts using equations like a, a, a logistic regression equation, a multiple okay. regression equation, right? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Yes. Good. It's all based on the logic and the propositions and the constructs. Okay, and most of the time, these equations have already been developed. Good. But based on your research, right? And the theory that you're trying okay. to use, you can modify these equations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome, Isaac. Oh, please I have a question. Go ahead, Ipia. Isaac is applying his yes. mathematics to marketing. <laughs> yeah. So, in relation to the logic you spoke about, can there yeah. be a situation where the customer is neither here or there? That's where the customer is not um wasn't satisfied positively or negatively. It's not possible. Okay. Because based on the assumptions, the customer must have purchased the product and consumed it. Okay. So the assumptions include the fact that consumption must have taken place. So you can't measure okay. satisfaction if you have not gone ahead to purchase and consume the product or consume the product after someone has purchased it. Okay. Because it is only through consumption that you can be able to rate. And once you have consumed it, definitely you will compare it to what you were expecting. 
So it's either it checks all your boxes or it did not. Okay. That's the assumption of expectation disconfirmation. Okay. But in reality, okay, when we are doing research, depending on the paradigm mm -hmm. you are coming from, personally, I am a critical realist, right? So we yes. always believe that there's an in-between. Okay. So if I develop a questionnaire, right, okay. I will always put a neutral in between right. my responses. Because yeah. there's a likelihood that the customer will not have any any feelings to share. They are just blah, right? That is why you need to pay close attention to the characteristics of the theories that you use. Because the assumptions okay. create some kind of bounded reality. That's why it's also called boundary conditions. Do you get it? Yes. So please. they will not use the all other things being equal. Yes, they will use, depending on these factors, this will happen. Thank you. So you have to limit your expectations, right? And your, your assumptions to what the theory provides for. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome, Ipia. Um, Leila, you said with logic, can you say one concept is dependent on the other? You can't say that categorically. You need to be able to know what the theory provides for and the nature of the concepts in them before you can see whether one depends on the other. Because the theory could also tell us that one, one construct does not depend on the other, they go together or they complement each other. Are you with me, Leila, too? Leila, are you with me? Hello, okay. So you need to know what the theory provides for in terms of the construct it studies, the propositions of how these constructs relate to each other and the logic underlying this. Good, so it could be causative or correlated. Good, that is why by understanding how the, the concepts relate to each other, if you are doing quantitative, you can be able to determine which statistical test will best help you to test the relationship between them. Very good, Isaac. So if it is a, a more of a correlation between them, then you know you have to use either the Pearson correlation or the Spearman correlation to see the strength and direction of this correlation. If it is more of a causative, then you need to go for more causative techniques like multiple regression, structural equation modeling, among others, to be able to see if there's this causality and, and we can prove it. Very good, Isaac. Isaac, you must be very happy in class today because everything is making sense. You're welcome, Isaac. Right? So in every theory that you come across, you need to be able to pick the theory apart using these building blocks to help you understand its basis. Once you understand its basis, you will know how you can apply it to the research that you are doing based on the research objectives you have identified that you want to address. So don't just take a theory and look at it at face value and say, I can use this theory to explain my work. No, don't rush. Break it down using the building blocks and see what the building blocks are and how it falls in line with the objectives of the research that you're trying to do. And that is the only way you can be able to find good theories that can form the basis for the research work that you are doing, right? So like we have identified, the constructs are the number one building block. They can either be unidimensional or multidimensional, meaning that you can have a theory that explains a phenomenon using only one construct. If this, then that. Or you can have multidimensional constructs where if this, then that. However, the this has a lot of subs under it. So in marketing, for instance, we have trust and commitment. And we are saying that trust and commitment influence loyalty according to the commitment trust theory by Morgan and Hunt. But trust is a multidimensional construct that is made up of ability, benevolence, and integrity. So if you are doing research, you need to be able to determine whether or not you are looking at trust in its multidimensional form or in its unidimensional form, both forms of which you can explain using the commitment trust theory. However, if you decide to break down trust into its different parts, there's another theory that applies to the multidimensional form of trust, 
which is referred to as the ABI model. So you need to be able to understand the constructs that you are studying to know how you can even apply them in your research work. So two people can use the commitment trust theory to do a research looking at how trust influences customer loyalty. But one of them will look at trust unidimensionally as a single construct. And then another one will take trust and break it down into its multidimensional components. And that comes from a basic understanding and appreciation of the theory and how the constructs can be formulated or conceptualized to help you go about your own research work. So in the face of this, we are saying that all the constructs must have a clear and unambiguous operational definition, regardless of whether you decide to take it in a unidimensional form or in a multidimensional form. And once you do that, you need to specify exactly how the constructs will be measured and at what level of analysis you are measuring it, be it at the individual level, the group level, or the organizational level. Because some theories by virtue of their design can only be applied to research involving individuals. Whereas others are designed for firm level research and others are also divine, designed for group level research. So you need to know the level of analysis that that theory applies to and keep your research within that domain. So you can't pick a theory that is meant for individual level analysis and then go and apply it to analyzing what pertains to an organization. Please, does it make sense? Yes, so yes please. It seems you are all very quiet. Yes, please. What's going on? I'm taking feedback. What's going on? Isaac says, in that case, a study could be filling the gap by considering something as small as an additional construct. Bingo, Isaac. Bingo. Mm -hmm. You hit the nail on the head. So when we say research gap, your research gap that you are addressing could be something as small as introducing an additional construct. And that's what your research work is contributing to existing literature. In fact, with this comment alone, if I haven't done anything here today, I'm happy. I know I've done this. Do you get it now? Yes, please. Yes, right. doc. So your whole MPhil thesis could be built around the fact that you have taken a theory you are studying, the constructs have traditionally been studied in this particular way, and you are looking at this new one, like Ron said, the CBB model has been studied extensively, but brand resonance tends to be ignored. So he is focusing on brand resonance, right? But also looking at it in the context of the other levels that lead up to brand resonance. So something as small as one, one, one additional construct can be your contribution, right? So that is it for the construct building block. So in, in quantitative research, for instance, we turn these constructs into measurable variables. And then we find measures or statements or items that will measure each of them. And then we collect data on them and then we analyze, right? But for the qualitative people, they will leave it at the level of the propositions. So whereas quantitative researchers will have hypotheses, right? Qualitative researchers will have propositions because they are not turning the item into a quantifiable form. So they do not need individual items to measure them, which they can quantify into figures and analyze. They are looking at propositions and seeing how these propositions can be actualized in reality. And they explore how the propositions play out. So in terms of theory, we have always have the theoretical plane and the empirical plane. For quantitative researchers to be able to convert variables into measurement items that they can turn into numbers to run statistical analysis, they need to descend into the empirical plane and turn these, these constructs into variables and formulate hypotheses on how they relate to each other. Whereas the qualitative people will stay in the theoretical plane, look at the constructs in their natural form and explore them as they are, using the propositions of how the relationships between them have been established. So by exploring the constructs as they, as they are, they can confirm or dispute these propositions. And perhaps along the way, end up adding additional propositions or unearthing another dimension of propositions regarding how the constructs relate to each other. Okay, so when we talk about propositions, generally in terms of theory building blocks, we refer to propositions as the associations postulated between constructs based on deductive logic, right? But when we decide to break it up into quantitative and qualitative research, 
We, the quantitative people, state it in the form of a declarative statement that indicates a cause and effect relationship, or perhaps a correlation relationship, where X is correlated to Y, or X has a link with Y, or X has a relationship with Y. Or if it's cause and effect, if X occurs, then Y occurs, right? So Y is dependent upon the occurrence of X. That's quantitative. But for qualitative, they deal more with the propositions on a conjectural level, right? Where they make inferences based on the propositions of how these constructs relate to each other. And they are able to test it empirically by gathering data to either confirm or disprove these propositions and examine how these propositions play out in reality. So either way, propositions can be tested, be it quantitatively or qualitative. And in testing them, you can either reject them or find support for them based on the empirical observations or the empirical evidence you obtain as a result of testing these propositions, either quantitatively or qualitatively, right? However, like constructs, propositions are stated at a theoretical level, like I mentioned. So if you're a qualitative researcher, you have it at a theoretical level. Whereas for quantitative researchers like, like myself, who always want to turn propositions into hypotheses or into quantifiable forms that we can actually measure and run statistical analysis to either prove or disprove, we will go ahead and examine the relationships between the two constructs in the form of variables that have a hypothesized relationship. Right? So I emphasize again, quantitative researchers will turn propositions into hypotheses. Whereas qualitative researchers will keep them as propositions at a theoretical level and go ahead and explore to be able to see if they can prove or disprove these propositions that have been made. Okay. And for the third building block, which is the logic, we have talked about the fact that it provides the basis for justifying the propositions that we have postulated. So it's basically the glue that holds the theoretical constructs together and provides meaning and relevance to the relationships that we have indicated between them based on the propositions. So logic also represents the explanation that lies at the core of the theory, like the way we were able to provide explanation for expectation disconfirmation. We were able to explain why expectation, right, can be positively or negatively disconfirmed to lead to either satisfaction or dissatisfaction. And the logic under it is that customers always have needs and these needs lead them to create certain expectations when they come into a consumption experience. And if these expectations are confirmed, they are happy, they are satisfied. If they are disconfirmed, they are unhappy, right? So without logic, propositions will just be ad hoc or arbitrary. They will have no meaning because we will have no explanation as to why we are making this proposition, as to why we are formulating this hypothesis. There should be a reason why this particular factor has a causal effect on the other, right? So without logic, Propositions cannot be tied into a cohesive system of propositions that brain at the heart of any theory that we can observe, be it a theory that has actual constructs in the form of a framework or a theory that comes in statement form in the form of propositions. So that is it for the logic building block. And finally, we can talk about the assumptions, right? And that is basically the fact that theories are constrained by assumptions. So, Theories that are constrained by assumptions, theories are constrained, sorry, by assumptions about perhaps values, time, and space. And these constraints make us refer to assumptions also as boundary conditions. And they govern where we can apply the theory and where we cannot apply it. So like I was explaining to a peer journal earlier on, expectation disconfirmation just covers the levels of satisfaction and dissatisfaction. It doesn't cover neutrality. We are either satisfied delighted or dissatisfied, right? There's no in between where you're neutral. And that is because of the assumptions of the theory. It also doesn't cover post, is it post-purchase evaluation, right? So the expectation disconfirmation theory is limited by what we refer to as um, the boundary conditions of the customer um, just having to purchase the product and consume it. So it's their experiences after they have consumed the product. But after if they are uh, experiences immediately after they consume the product, sorry, by comparing it with their expectations. But you will bear with me that after you have bought a product and consumed it, 
and, and measure it against your expectations and at that moment determine whether you are satisfied or dissatisfied. Later on, after some time, you still think about that consumption experience. And you either end up being consistently happy with your decision or regretting it. True or false? True. True. Very but true. the expectation this confirmation theory does not cover that. So another theory was developed to cover that aspect where long after the consumption experience and you determine whether you're satisfied or dissatisfied, you still think about that experience and you ask yourself whether it was worth it or not. And that theory is referred to as the cognitive dissonance theory. Who has heard of cognitive dissonance theory before? Cognitive dissonance. Yes, cognitive dissonance. Good. Yes. Good. Do you know the authors? Uh, or the propounders. So I'll give you the name of one of them. <laughs> He's called Sweeney. So the Googler, go ahead and Google and tell us the names of all the authors. I'm giving you one. So do Sweeney cognitive dissonance and see what we will get. Are you there? Are you doing the Googling? Where are the Googlers? Ron, have you disappeared or you're still in the system? Wrong. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Where are the Googlers? Are you Googling to tell us? I've given you one name, Sweeney. So do Sweeney and then add comma, cognitive dissonance, and let's see what happens. Who is going to tell us? Quickly. Nuruddin. Are you there? Yes. Yes, Doc. Okay. Whose hand is up? Yeah, okay, yeah. so Isaac, yeah, Isaac, go ahead. So it's Sweeney and who and who? There's three of them. Sweeney, PD and Grabba. Grabba and Gail. That's what they have here. Sweeney, PD. Okay, and Grabba. so look for the article that developed the cognitive dissonance yes. skill. Okay. The, the article that you are mentioning now, what year was it? 1984. Okay, so be more re come more recently to the year 2000. Or I think it's the 2000, yeah. That's when they came up with the skill for cognitive dissonance after purchase. Suta, that's another one. Good run. So it's Sweeney, Suta, and another person. So we've got two names. We've got Gillian Sweeney, Geoffrey Suter. There's a third person. Who is going to tell us? Douglas House next. Good. Good, Ekiaja. So these are the three people, right? The title of the article is Cognitive Dissonance After Purchase, a Multidimensional Skill. So this article is all about cognitive dissonance, right? An aspect of, of the satisfaction a matrix that the expectation disconfirmation theory does not cover. You see, so based on assumptions, you can be able to know the limitations of any theory you are trying to apply and know how far you can stretch it in terms of your research work. So let's look at a typical example, right? Many economic theories assume that human beings are rational and they employ utility maximization based on cost and benefit expectations as a way of understanding human behavior. So any economic theory that looks at human behavior, the first assumption that they have is that the human being is rational. Mm -hmm. True or false? We all did economics. True, but we are not. <laughs> exactly. So that is one of the limitations of the theory. So the limitations of the theory lies in its core assumptions. Right? Human beings are not completely rational. <laughs> and not all human beings in all situations seek utility maximization, true or false? Yeah. So that is how assumptions can limit the application of a given theory to research work. Right? So we can have theories that may have implicit assumptions in relation to culture. 
right? Whether or not you can apply the theory to an individualistic culture or a collective culture, right? You can have certain theories that are temporal. Some theories explain um, certain phenomena in terms of time frame and space, like the stages of change model. Who has heard of the stages of change model? Stages of change. If you are trying, you should have heard of it. Anyone who did an undergrad degree in marketing must have heard of the stages of change model. Clancy. Where are the first degree marketing holders? Doug, please, you are here. Uh huh. Do you remember stages of change model? Do you remember? I've heard the name, but I don't know what it is. I've, I've forgotten what it is. Okay, but which area of marketing do you remember hearing it in? Which area of marketing? You know, we have different areas, tourism marketing, brand management, yes, service marketing. Me. Which specific one? Or oh, you don't remember that one too? Doc, I'm trying to remember. Okay. So let me give you guys a clue. Stages of change model is about adopting positive behaviors. Does that give you a clue? It's Doc, social is it human things. behavior. Okay. Uh, so, social, social, social market. Social marketing. Uh, social marketing. Social marketing is all about applying commercial marketing concepts to what? Get people to change their behavior, right? Yes, and that's what the stages of change model is all about. Yes. Please. And it talks about different stages at specific points in time where the individual or the human being is adopting the change. It happens in stages, according to the stages of change model, which occurs at different times. So that's a typical uh, assumption of how the stages of uh, how um, a theory can be limited in terms of temporal assumption, right? We can also talk about spatial assumptions, where the theory may apply to certain localities but not to others, right? Like agency theory. Agency theory applies to who and who. Principal and agent. Principal and agent. So if you're not a principal, in a principal or agent relationship, you cannot apply the agency theory to that phenomenon unless we have the phenomenon occurring involving some kind of principal and agent relationship going on, right? So these are examples of assumptions that can limit the application of theory to the research that you are doing. That is why you need to be abreast of a wide range of theories so that you can be able to break them down using their building blocks to determine whether or not they, they are applicable to the research work that you are doing and the constructs or the phenomenon that you are trying to study. So in this class alone, already we've learned about four or five theories, right? Can someone name all the theories we've learned in this session alone? Can someone name the first one? Papa, can you name one theory we've learned in this session, one? Yes. Um, expectation disconfirmation mm -hmm. theory. Good. By Richard who? Oliver. Aha. Uh -huh. That's one. By Richard Oliver. Good. That's one. Another one. We've learned about four or five. Another one. Ron, tell us, uh, tell us the second one. Or oh, Bapo, you want to come again? Bapo, go ahead. Um, customer based entity model. Okay, so let me let me help you out. It's the customer-based brand equity model. Let me repeat it again. Customer-based brand equity model. C B B E. Okay. Good. Thank you. You're welcome. The ladies are saying grounded theory. Good. That's another one. We have another one. We we also learned about another one. There's about three more that we have talked about up until this point. Stages of change model. Good. Two more. More. Cognitive dissonance. Cognitive theory. dissonance. Good. That's another one. Then the PRJ has given us the last one, which is agency theory. Alima to cognitive dissonance has two S's. So D I double S O N A N C E. Cognitive dissonance by Sweeney, Housenek, and Sota, 2000. Right? Good. So in essence, if you have not taken anything from this class at all, at least you know the building blocks of a theory. What are the building blocks of a theory? Quickly. How many are there and what are they? 
quickly, 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 quickly. Mida, go ahead. Mida, building blocks of a theory. Equia just says there are four. She has helped you. Manaf has mentioned one, constructs. Good. So the constructs in the theory. What else? Propositions. Propositions. Good. What else? Yes, there's logic. There's logic. Good. And then the last one. And there are assumptions. Good. So if you don't take anything from this class, you know the building blocks of a theory. And you have learned about six different kinds of theories that we can apply in marketing research. True or false? Oh. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Let's proceed. You, you are sounding more confident now, so it's making me happy. <laughs> right? So as, as we, we were discussing in terms of assumptions, right? One other thing I want you to, to take cognizance of when it comes to assumptions is that theorists rarely state their implicit assumptions clearly. And that's one thing I want you to learn about theories. Some theories exist and the assumptions regarding them are not clearly stated. The constructs are stated, the propositions are given, the logic is provided, but you will not see clear assumptions as to the boundaries. So for a lot of the theories, you will have to start applying it to learn its limitations. For instance, before I landed on the signaling theory in my research work, I started at something we refer to as the process virtualization theory. We also talked about how you could use digital technology to create certain events, right? Or to convert certain processes into digital processes to get certain reactions out of customers. However, the process virtualization theory did not provide any clear assumptions regarding its application. So I assumed that I could apply process virtualization theory to explain some of the processes that the uh, banks at that time were con 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 reconfiguring for the online context and using that to build trust and commitment. Right, sorry. However, quickly I realized that the process virtualization theory will not help me to be able to explain how once those processes are reconfigured for the online context, they can have an effect on customer outcomes. The process virtualization theory basically talked about how the process is turned into a virtual form, but it doesn't talk again about how it can affect other things in its virtual form. Please, does it make sense? Okay, does. Good. So I had to abandon process virtualization and find a theory that will help me to not only talk about how they are reconfiguring their offline processes for online, but how once the reconfiguration has taken place, it can affect other customer outcomes like trust and commitment. And the signaling theory gave me that opportunity or capability because of its nature and the assumptions that signaling theory had. So it's very important for us to know this that assumptions will not always be provided by all the theories that we come across. So we need to be able to approach them with caution, reading as much as we can about the theory, its origins, its critiques, so that we'll be able to know all the building blocks, which ones are present, which ones are not, and how what we have currently, in terms of what has been provided by means of building blocks for that particular theory, can help us to achieve our research objectives. If not, we drop it and we move on in search of another theory that will give, um, that will do a better job at giving us what we are looking for. Isaac, your hand was up, or you're good. Yeah, you just answered my question. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So, what are the attributes of a good theory? A good theory has logical consistency, right? And here we are talking about the fact that. The theoretical constructs, propositions, boundary conditions, and assumptions are logically consistent with each other, right? So if some of the building blocks that we are talking about of a theory are inconsistent with each other, then the theory is a poor theory. The construct cannot be tangential to the propositions and the logic. It all has to come together and make sense. And that leads us to the next attribute of a good theory, which is explanatory power, right? And the question we want to ask here is how well does the theory explain or predict the reality that we are trying to study? In my case, process virtualization tried to predict or explain that reality I was studying, but I didn't do it to the point where it helped me to achieve my research objectives. And the signaling theory, which was a rival theory, did a better job. So here, I jumped ship and went in for signaling theory. 
because it had more explanatory power regarding the phenomenon I was trying to study than the process virtualization theory. So here, explanatory power is also important for a good theory that you can use in your research work. Another thing we can talk about is the fact that theory should be falsifiable, right? Theory shouldn't be so ironclad that you cannot disprove them by conducting an empirical study, right? So falsifiability ensures that the theory is potentially disprovable if empirical data does not match with the theoretical propositions because theories are propounded by human beings who also go through various rounds of research. So it is possible that the conditions at that time enable them to come up with certain propositions. However, conditions in this present time in which you are retesting this theory could be different and could therefore help you to be able to disprove some of the propositions that had been made initially when the theory was propounded. So theories cannot be theories unless they can be empirically testable and falsifiable. Another thing too about a good theory is that it has to be parsimonious, right? And parsimony basically examines how much of a phenomenon is explained with how few variables. So parsimony is basically looking at how simple the theory is in terms of the number of constructs that it has and the propositions that surround these constructs, right? So among competing explanations that sufficiently explain the observed evidence, the simplest theory is the best because theories are already complicated to apply anyway. So imagine dealing with theory and all its complications along with manifold variables that are also highly complicated, complicating more and already complicated process. So parsimony is important to keep things simple and straightforward so that you can be able to easily explain the concept you're trying to study, how they relate to each other, the logic underlying it, and be able to test using empirical data to either prove or disprove the propositions made within the theory, right? So these are four key attributes of a good theory. So with that, let's go on and look at a physical example application of a theory in digital marketing research. And like I said earlier, as researchers, we are not limited as to where we can take theory from. I remember one of our, my colleagues, Dr. George Champo, at some point was nursing the idea of using mitosis to explain a phenomenon that occurs in entrepreneurship. Please who knows what mitosis is about? Mitosis, by the way, is I think from biology. Does anyone know what mitosis is about? So mitosis is basically how cells multiply. Yes. And he was, he was trying to use that concept to explain an aspect of entrepreneurship, to explain how SMEs spring up. Uh, that would have been interesting, isn't it? Very good. So, good. So that captures the whole idea of what I'm trying to tell you in terms of the fact that you can pick a theory from anywhere, provided it is relevant and has some underlying propositions and logic that help you to be able to explain what is happening in respect of the phenomenon that you are studying. So let's look at a very fun theory, like the media richness theory, which is from communication studies. But we apply it in marketing to be able to explain the ability of the internet to be able to facilitate rich media. Remember we talked about the fact that the internet has the capability of supporting rich media. You remember? Yes, we did. What are some of the rich media we talked about? What are some of the rich media we talked about that the internet helps us to, to use? Media name one. Mida, can you hear me at all? No. Yes. Is it a paid end and own media? Yeah, but we are talking about the fact that the richness of the media, the internet gives us the ability to use certain functionalities to, to give the media its richness. Right? Who remembers that we mentioned? Can you come again, please? Who, may, who remembers that we mentioned that the rich media include text? Who remembers? 
Good. Deborah has remembered another one. Videos. And then there's a third one. Text videos and what? Audio. Audio. And then there's another one. Text videos, audio, and what? Uh, another virtual one. Reality. So virtual reality and the others rely on what? Video games rely on what? Graphics. Do you remember? Good. Yeah, so graphics or pictures, right? So the internet enables us to do so, right? And, and that is, is essentially the, the basis of the media richness theory. So let's go into it. So the media richness theory, as we are going to discuss it now, is based on an article that was written by these people, right? By Alamakea, Pesonen, and Dorina, right? In an article called Information Processing and Management in the year 2019. So let's break down the theory from its foundations, right? Starting with the propounders of the theory and what its building blocks are. So the theory known as the media richness theory was propounded by Daft and Lengel 1986, right? The theory basically explains how communications media affect task performance. So here the concepts we are looking at are what? What are the concepts? Hey, the constructs, sorry. The constructs. If we are saying the theory explains how communications media affect task performance, what constructs are we dealing with here? Communication and task performance. Good. So we are dealing with communications media and task performance, right? So the proponents argue that managers could improve their task performance by matching the characteristics of media to the needs of organizational information processing tasks. So that is how the two constructs relate to each other. So what I just read is what building block. What building block is that? The proposition. The proposition. So the proposition here is that media characteristics have to be matched with organizational information processing tasks to be able to achieve desired outcomes. So that's the proposition. That's how they relate to each other. Okay. So here, let's look at the logic and assumptions underlying all this together. So let's first look at the media construct. Now the logic here is that media vary in terms of their information richness based on their capacity to facilitate shared meaning within a given time, right? So four factors influence the richness of a medium, which is first of all, the communication medium used and its ability to transmit multiple cues. So one of the, the, the characteristics or the factors here is the ability of the medium to transmit multiple cues, including vocal inflection, gestures, and facial expression. Another factor is its immediacy of feedback. In using that medium, how immediately can you get feedback from the party on the other end, right? And it also talks about language variety. How many varieties of language can you use with the medium? Mm -hmm. And then we can also talk about the personal focus of the medium. Is the medium more personally focused or more um, impersonal in terms of its interaction between sender and receiver, right? So here it is breaking down the construct into its sub-dimensions, right? So we know that the media construct can differ based on the amount of cues it is able to transmit, its immediacy of feedback, its language variety, and the personal focus of the medium, right? Yes, though. So someone can decide they are using media richness theory, but they are basically taking just one of the subconstructs of media, be it perhaps transmitting multiple cues, and test how that can be applied in digital marketing to obtain certain outcomes. Are you with me? Yes, though. And that is what the article that we are going to discuss at the end did. They just looked at one aspect of the media construct, which is the transmission of multiple cues. And that is what they tested in their entire article. Okay. So the fact that you are applying the theory doesn't mean you have to apply everything in the theory all the time, right? Like Isaac said, it can be one small construct. And that's where your contribution will lie. Next, let's look at the, the construct of, of task, right? And here again, they are telling us that the task construct has self. So here, they are saying that task can be categorized based on uncertainty and equivocality. 
So we have tasks of uncertainty where it refers to tasks that lack sufficient information and could be executed by obtaining and sharing the needed information. Whereas we have equivocal tasks, which are those tasks which have multiple and possibly conflicting interpretations of the information that is available, thereby presenting a challenge for participants to arrive at one shared meaning of the information. So again, as a researcher, you can decide to pick one element of media, which is the multiplicity of cues that can be transmitted, and look at how that influences the equivocality of the task in the digital mm. context. You have a whole research work. Are you with me? Yes, Doc. And it's all founded yes. on one theory, which is the word media richness theory. So we've learned seven theories in this class. Yeah. We did good. <laughs> okay. Right. So the propositions and logic here are that generally richer media enables users to achieve the task of communicating more quickly and to better understand ambiguous, difficult, and complex messages, and therefore would lead to better performance on equivocal tasks. Whereas in contrast, leaner media, right, which are not so rich, are better for low equivocality tasks. Right? So performance improves when managers use richer media for equivocal tasks and leaner media for non-equivocal tasks. Hence, the task media fit. So this is the logic behind the propositions that we have between the media and the task and how they relate to each other. So like I mentioned earlier, this article just picked on the uh, media richness theory as it has to do with the sub constructs of media and looked at the specific cues, right? So in their research, they studied the relationship between consumers and marketing videos where they put multiple cues including verbal and non-verbal cues to facilitate understanding. And they looked at the consumer's reactions to the different visuals that they presented to them that had the different cues in them, right? So they employed a variety of instructive, seductive, and decorative video content, all using verbal and non-verbal cues to be able to see the customer's reaction to the video online. And their findings show that concerning how media richness differences in video content trigger changes in tourist behavior, they were looking at tourists visiting and um, tourism websites. All of the three different mobile marketing videos that they created using the different cues and putting in the different elements of seductive and informative among others, right? Differed in the kind of message that they conveyed and how they conveyed the message. Meaning that it is confirming media richness theory that depending on the kind of media that you use and how rich it is, it can influence the tasks that you are you, you perform in terms of uncertainty and equivocality, right? So they proved that aspect of the theory. But it said, nonetheless, all the three videos had a positive impact on intentions and likelihood to act, especially on purchase intentions. Now, they also mentioned that prior research has shown that richer media does not directly improve the media effects. But less studied are the effects of specific cues. Please, you see that? Yes, People have studied the theory in general and how it's able to affect tasks, but they have not broken it down into the sub-constructs of the media, like we identified, yeah. the cues, the language, the feedback. So they decided to just focus on the cues aspect of the, of the, of the media construct and then see how that can be used to elicit a reaction or to perform a particular task with a given objective, right? So the individuals differ yes, from each other in their capacity to transmit multiple cues and increase personal focus to trigger behavioral intention. So behavioral intention here is the task that they, will, they were looking to accomplish. And they said this is because the more participants enjoyed and felt that the video impacted them emotionally, the more their participation, intention, and recall score improved in watching the instructional video. Instructional video, sorry. So this study extends the media richness research by demonstrating that the effects of media richness can vary within technically similar videos as they form different logical connections among non-verbal visual cues related to a video storyline. So by picking on the cues aspects which have not been studied that much, they have been able to prove that the sub of media play a significant role in how you can be able to achieve 
media and task fit using the media richness theory as the basis for the research, right? And with that, yes, we come no. to the end of our session today. So that brings me to your assignment. Six theories, right? So now I'm sending you into the world. You're also going to learn one theory each, everybody. Apart from the ones that we have learned today. So you, you go and find a theory that has been used in digital marketing research. And then you break it down the same way I have done. Tell us the building blocks. What are the constructs? What are the propositions? What is the logic? What are the assumptions? And how did these researchers apply it to their research based on the article that you find? So you need to be able to tell us who the proponents of the theory are. What are the building blocks? And then tell us how it was applied in the specific article that you found and which aspects of the theory they focused on and what their findings are based on that theory. 